There's something addictive about the killing. As one sportsman said of another, he had blood. Whenever a person kills a deer, it's like a dog killing a sheep. They can never keep away from it again. Whereas a traditional clansman might kill one for the pot and make use of the entire animal, these kills are only for the trophy. All they're interested in is the head, a natural coat rack, which makes this place probably the biggest cloakroom in the world. Highland dancing is second nature to Duncan MacLean. After all, he learnt the finer points from his mother in Scotland a matter of 85 years ago. Now 88 himself, he regularly has a Highland fling in the front room to remind himself of his days on the music hall and to entertain his wife, Elsie. Dance here by champions, this is by tradition a solo dance for men, an expression of sheer pride and exhilaration of race. It is a dance of fierce imagination, a medley of spring and lightness of foot, a fine and precise movement, robust and at the same time graceful. The credit for its birth was given to the antics of a courting stag on a Scottish hillside. An old shepherd was teaching his grandson to play the chanter when they spotted the stag. The old man asked if the boy could imitate it. Raising his hands above his head to simulate the antlers, the boy danced about, copying the love dance of the great deer. locals live in fear of. They approach silently and they hunt in packs. Once they've attacked, they return relentlessly in the pursuit of blood. Escape is impossible. They are... do a bit of fishing, so they just make it a misery. This is Midge Heaven, or for the people who live here, Midge Hell. You spend the whole day blowing away from your face and scratching and such and If I mush them around, they're millions all over my face and my hands. Uh -huh. Right, that's it. I've had enough. It's all these things are driving me mad. I'm afraid it's time for this. It's time for the next to head there. The number one reason, sadly, that people don't come back to Scotland for a holiday, midget. <laughs> the scenes near Braemar in the Deeside Highlands. And in spite of rather miserable weather, the park was packed in readiness for the royal arrivals. Princess Alexandra wearing an Inverness cape. The Queen with a feather in her cap. Princess Anne and Prince Philip. The Queen Mother was also there. And in salute to the royal family on holiday in Scotland, the Skirl of the Pipes. I now declare these gates open! Unlike golf, this is a Scottish sport that has never found much favour south of the border. But in Glen Finnan, a successful cable tosser is rated very highly indeed. 
Although the day Highland Man first tossed the caber isn't recorded, it happened, legend assures, many hundreds of years ago when woodmen developed the technique of catapulting trees into the river uh, for their journey to the sawmills. It has to land on its nose and pitch right forward. Otherwise, no go. Strength and perfect timing are two of the main essentials, plus a certain amount of agility if things should not go the right way. It's your it's mine if I want it. It is. Go on! <laughs> that was dreadful. I don't know how many Highland dancers get killed by flying hammers in a year, or tug of war teams decimated by shot putters, or spectators squashed by freshly tossed cabers. With half the village of Newton Moor watching, I was determined not to be beaten by Purvis. But something was about to happen that did make me drop the caber, even though it was only a small one. <laughs> yes, there's room for more children and more people in the Highlands. It's terrible to think that little more than a century ago, thousands of crofters were driven from their homes in the glens to make room for sheep farmers and sportsmen from the south. The side tragedy still lie heavy on the land. Oh, I'll not deny things are better known than when Geordie Mackay was a boy. But for all that, crofting is very much what it always has been. We have our three or four acres, and we have to work hard to grow a few potatoes, some vegetables for the house, a patch of oats, some hay, and a few cabinets for the beasts in the winter. And above the crop, on the slopes of the hills, we have our common ground where the sheep and the cattle are grazed. Highlanders are often visualized as just purveyors of good fishing, shooting, and glorious scenery. Yet the crofters are very different beings. With their small farms and ancient implements, they toil hard for their livelihood. On the moors, the top layer of soil is removed to disclose the peat beds, from which the precious fuel is dug. It takes several weeks before the peat is dry enough to use, and it's quite a common sight in the highlands to see the dug peat hanging under the cottage eaves. Time seems to have stayed its hand in many parts of the highlands, and spinning and weaving is still the work of nimble fingers and inherited skill. But the whole world knows the wonderful cloth that these industrious folk produce. This is Ian, a boy with a question mark over him. He is growing up in the highlands of Scotland on a small farm above Loch Ness and the Monster. What does the future hold for Ian, and for thousands of other youngsters like him in this remote corner of Britain? For more than a century, there's been a steady drain of people from the Highlands. But some do say, young Ian's father and mother, for instance, they saw the Highlands as a place of opportunity. Mr. and Mrs. Jack gave up city life and secure positions and bought themselves a tough job at derelict crops, fields and fence and choked with weeds. It may be very hard work, it is hard work, it's morning from night, every day, seven days a week, no breaks, no holidays, but I think it may be worth it. Worth it for the sake of Ian, to give him the heritage of a country upbringing in close touch with nature. The main idea, of course, is to get as much of this land as we can under grass, and with the grass we then can put cattle. And I think it is in cattle and in young calves that the future, at least our future last anyway, and the future of many small people.
call this the skyline, and it runs through some of the most gloomily beautiful country in the world. Country which looks and sounds as if it's out of Tolkien, with names like the Valley of Drizzle, and Raven Rock, and the Black Water. The locks and lonely crags and empty moors it passes through are thick with legends of giants and beasts, and one particularly fearsome witch known in the trade as Perry Agnes. Honestly, says so in the British Rail brochure. This is, without any exception, the most magnificent railway journey in the British Isles, the Mallet Line, from Fort William to the sea, and the observation car lets you see a problem. Rivers and mountains, birch trees, heather, bracken, and trout rings breaking on the rocks. Ah. Many of these little crossing communities in the Western Highlands are 60 miles or more from the nearest railway station. Aye, and before they made the new road, it was three days by horse or five and foot over the hill to land. But now we have the mail car. Every day, the mail car from Laird comes over to Afrishkill, bringing letters and parcels, news from the outside world and stores for the shop. A son of one leave, maybe. Hello, he's not here at home, my leave. By Jove, and he's looking well. It must be three years since he was home, Matt. But the most devoted family must meet the outside world sometimes. So usually the farmer provides transport twice a week to the nearest village or town so that the wife can get her shopping done and her man meet his friends. Before the trains came, the 30-mile journey from Fort William to the coast had to be done in a horse-drawn coach, bumping crazily over rough cart tracks. It took seven and a half hours to get there, so long that it could never get back the same day. The railway reduced this time to little over one hour, an improvement of something like 80%.